So, here we go, we can start. So we do the Namo Tassa first of all. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Alahato Samha Sampudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Alahato Samha Sampudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Alahato Samma Sampodasa Bhutan Dhamman Sangang Namasami So the introduction for those of you who haven't been here before, this little uh, presentation is based on a book which was written by Venuanyana Tiloka over a hundred years ago called The Word of the Buddha and that particular book was based on some core suttas, these are teachings of the Buddha and it was an anthology based on the Four Noble Truths and with the Four Noble Truths we have the Eightfold Path as the Fourth Noble Truth and in this uh, translation which I have done, trying to modernize the translation, make it more meaningful and more accurate uh, we've already uh, discussed the first three Noble Truths and a uh, little bit about the Fourth Noble Truth about the path and on that path we have the eight factors of the path and the first one we're looking through is right view which takes the majority of um, this uh, presentation so I already mentioned a little bit about the basics of right view and wrong view and now we come to the unprofitable questions if anyone should say thus I will not become a practicing Buddhist until I discover whether this universe is eternal or not, finite or infinite, whether my permanent essence and my body are the same. I use the word permanent essence as a, uh, uh, the idea of an atta, a self or a soul, uh, because I want to give that word a much more accurate meaning. What we mean by the word soul or a self in Buddhism it means some essence, some part of you, uh, essential part of you, uh, without which you cannot be, exist, and which continues forever, a permanent essence. So many people have that idea of as a soul, or an infinite consciousness, a ground of all being, or whatever word you wish to call it, a permanent essence. So, I will not become a practicing Buddhist until I know whether my permanent essence and my body are the same or my permanent essence is one thing, my body is another or whether the Buddha persists after death or does not persist after death or both persists and does not persist after death or neither persists nor does not persist after death that person would die before they found out so these are what we call the philosophical questions and it's not actually become experiencing the answers to this but being told as a belief system. I want to be told what you believe, what is right, and I will not become a Buddhist until you answer these questions for me. And the Buddha gave the very common simile, and the Buddha's simile was suppose somebody was um, shot with an arrow. And I'm trying to modernize these similes by keeping their essence. Suppose a person was shot with a gun, and medics would come to help them. Then that person said, hang on a minute, who pulled the trigger? What type of gun did they use? And why did they shoot me? Moreover, let me see your medical qualifications first. I will not let you treat me until you answer all these questions. That person would be considered to have wrong view and might die before their questions were answered. So that's my translation of a well-known simile of being shot by an arrow, a poisoned arrow. So, uh, trying to change the similes to bring them a little bit more up to date, make them more useful. Therefore, one who seeks her own welfare should put out the bullet, the bullet of unhappiness, pain and suffering. First of all, so you don't go and ask these great philosophical questions the Buddha is saying is actually just you know, suffering, unhappiness. Figure that one out first of all. The other ones will come afterwards. For one with the view that life is eternal, the universe is eternal, 
the holy, holy life is without meaning. In other words, there's no end of you. And for one with a view of life, the universe is not eternal. Again, the holy life is without meaning. You're going to end anyway. Whether one has the view the universe is eternal or the universe is not eternal, there is rebirth, there is aging, there is death, there is sorrow, crying, pain, unhappiness and distress. The destruction of which I prescribe in this very life. So we're not really saying that, you know, are you going to exist afterwards in heaven forever after? Or are you not going to exist at all? Uh, so instead we say, these are the problems, birth, aging, death, sorrow, crying, pain, unhappiness. And the path of Buddhism is to destroy those things. This is like right view, focusing on what Buddhism is actually teaching you and giving you and what's most important. Any comments or questions about that so far? Okay, so in order to end suffering, rather than to give you philosophical answers, which I said, you'll find out the answers to those questions later on, but you don't believe what the Buddha says about them, you find out for yourself. But that is not the main purpose, know why the Buddha taught. The Buddha taught to end birth, to end suffering. So now we have the five basic fetters. A fetter is, I actually should get a better word for this, a fetter is like a ball and chain, something which ties you to, uh, um, uh, I think they used to put these fetters on, on criminals you know, 100, 200 years ago, chaining their legs together. The fetters are what stops you progressing, stops you being happy, stops you being free. Here, one who has not seen the Dhamma, and we call this a putuchana, it literally means the ordinary folk, abides with a mind addicted and attached to a view of a permanent essence. And they do not even seek an escape from the long-standing wrong view of a permanent essence. When that wrong view of a permanent essence has become habitual, it is regarded as a basic fetter. In other words, you know, you just look at life, you assume life uh, from a point of view of a permanent essence somewhere within you. One who abides with a mind addicted and attached to skeptical doubt or to a belief that rites and rituals are sufficient in themselves to reach awakening, to desire for the five senses, addicted and attached to aversion, then they don't even seek an escape from these states, then when these states have become habitual, they are regarded as the five basic fetters. In the suttas, they sometimes call them the lower fetters, and the other ones are higher fetters, but to me, fetters are fetters. One is basic, one is much more refined. So I use the word basic fetters instead of lower. Any these, the five basic fetters, are what tie you to the world and stop you being, a, the first three fetters stop you being a stream winner and the next two fetters stop you from becoming a non-returner. Any questions about that? Comments? Okay, we'll carry on. <coughs> now those are the problems and this is one of the reasons why those problems are not overcome. Again, the basic fetter, number one, is the mind addicted and attached to the view of a permanent essence. For those of you who know Pali, that's called Sakaya Ditti, sometimes called self-view. The first of the fetters, the one which you overcome, which uh, sends you on the path to enlightenment, to realize this, no driver of the bus, which is you. So that's the, what I'm saying here, the view of a permanent essence, which is hearing me, knowing what's happening, and making decisions in your life. So, one who has not seen the Dhamma does not understand what things are fit for contemplation and what things are not. Thus, they contemplate on those things unfit for attention, or not on those things fit for attention. 
In other words, one is not even looking in the right place to find where the Dhamma is. And the Buddha gives examples of what is looking in the wrong place, how you contemplate unwisely. Did my soul exist in the past? Did my soul not exist in the past? What was my soul in the past? How was my soul in the past? Having been what did my soul become in the past? Shall my soul be in the future? Shall my soul not be in the future? What shall my soul be in the future? How shall my soul be in the future? Having been what, what shall my soul become in the future? Or else you are inwardly perplexed about the present. Is this my soul? Is this not my soul? What is this soul? How is this soul? Where has this soul come from? Where will it go? And I use the word soul in here instead of permanent essence because this is usually the word which is used when you contemplate unwisely, your soul, your essence, whatever. And the reason why these are unwise considerations is because they all, uh, they all are founded on the existence of a soul. Yes, you are here, I am, and now you want to say, was I in the past, or no, did I just come in this present? And what was my soul in the past? How was my soul in the past? And what is this soul? How is this soul? Where has this soul come to be? This all assumes there is a soul somewhere and you're trying to find out where it is and what it is. A simile is looking for the Loch Ness Monster. Just because you haven't found the Loch Ness Monster doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Maybe it's hiding in some deep cave underneath the waters in that lake in northern Scotland. So just because no one's found it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So people keep looking at it and of course they're looking in the wrong place. So when you think there may be something there, it's unwise considerations. So six views about the soul. When you attend unwisely in this way, when you're looking in the wrong place, one of these views, conclusions, comes about. The view that I possess a soul arises you as true and established. Or the view I possess no soul, only a material body whose consciousness, conscious life is a mere byproduct of a brain arises in you as true and established. I'll just read them out and I'll go back upon them afterwards. Or the view, I know the soul with the soul, which is similar to I know therefore I am, arises you in true and perceived. Or the view, I perceive there is no soul with the soul, arises in you as true and established. And that is, the soul is but cannot be seen. Or the view, I perceive a soul with what is not a soul, arises in you as true and established. The five candles can know the original mind or else you have some such view as this, it is this soul of mine that speaks and feels and experiences here and there the result of good and bad actions, but this soul of mine is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and will endure as long as eternity. In Buddhism, those are the six wrong views about the soul. I go over them because they're important. The view I possess a soul arises in you as true and established. is the most common view in Western cultures you know, where uh, the Abrahamic religions of Judaism, uh, Christianity and Islam uh, take it for granted, it's true and established, that they have a soul. Or we have the view, which is a materialist view, which uh, obviously many scientists uh, espouse. I possess no soul, only a material body whose conscious life is mere byproduct of a brain. So in other words, the consciousness will stop once the brain stops. That's the materialist view. Or the view, I know the soul with a soul. And I sort of equated that with a famous uh, saying, Descartes, I know, therefore I am. It wasn't, it wasn't Descartes, who was that? I know, therefore I am. It was Descartes. I, think. I know, therefore I am, arouses in you. You know something, you're aware of what's going on here, so you assume because you are aware, because you know, because you feel, then you must have a soul. Or I perceive there is no soul with a soul arises in you, 
as true and established. So you say, well, I'm sure there is a soul, but I cannot see a no soul. But I have a soul, but it cannot be perceived. The soul is, but cannot be seen. Or the view, I perceive a soul with what is without a soul. The, uh, the apparatus of knowing, which is the five candors, the five, uh, um, the five components of existence, I call them, that is not a soul, but it can actually know a soul, it can perceive the soul. And that is the five candors aren't the mind, aren't the soul, but they can know what is a soul. Or else you can have such view as this, which is a far more common view. It is this soul of mind that speaks and feels and experiences here and there the result of good and bad actions. In other words, I am the one who knows. But this soul of mind is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and will endure as long as eternity. Now the only real way you can understand what is wrong view is to see it in the contrast with the right view. And this is the right view which the Buddha stated, and this is another explanation of the middle way. That word, the middle way, is referring to the practice which we do, avoiding the extremes of uh, austerities and indulgence, but it's also a philosophical middle view between existence and non-existence, and this is the right view. Venerable Sir, it is said, right view, right view. In what way is there right view? What is the truth? Asking the Buddha. The world, Kachana, mostly depends on a duality, upon a theory of existence or of non-existence. Now the soul is, the world is, or there is no soul, there is nothing, there is no world. But for one who sees the origin of phenomena as it really is, there is no idea of non-existence of the world. And for one who sees the cessation of phenomena as it really is, there is no idea of existence of the world. It's something in the middle between existence and nothing. Because you can perceive things arising coming into existence, you can't say there's nothing. But because they pass away almost immediately, they arise, we can't say there is existence. It's the middle between existence and non-existence. What I often call the process. You can't say there's something there because it's changing 100% every moment. You can't say there's nothing because there's nothing, there wouldn't be even anything changing. A process, something between existence and non-existence. A third option. So we don't say there is a soul, that's existence, that's one extreme. We can't say there's nothing at all, it's just, you know, just uh, a byproduct of the brain. That is another extreme. The third option is the process. And then we see further on. Most people are attached to one of these wrong views. But one with right view disengages from such dualistic theories about my soul. You either are or you're not. Instead, you have no perplexity or doubt that what arises, what actually comes into existence, is only suffering arises, and what ceases is only suffering ceases. Your knowledge about this is independent of mere belief and acceptance it's, you know, from experience. In this way there is right view. Phenomena exist is one extreme. Phenomena do not exist is the second extreme. Without veering to either of these extremes, the Buddha teaches the Dhamma by the middle, dependent origination. With delusion as the cause, volition arises, from volition we get consciousnesses and this whole dependent origination process which was mentioned before will be mentioned again. The dependent origination is describing a process. One thing which causes another, which causes another, which causes another. To give my own simile, to try and make this very deep part of the Dhamma 
more intelligible for you. The best simile which I've ever come up with was that of like a mango. You eat a mango and you save the seed. You plant the seed in your garden and uh, maybe a five, ten years later on you have a new mango tree. And you can see the process from that first mango to the mango you eat ten years later from the tree which is generated from the seed. You can see that seed in the ground start to split and a tiny green shoot start to work its way slowly, day by day, getting closer to the surface. And when it pushes through the soil and it can be seen just a tiny, looks like a piece of grass and as it grows and grows and grows the stem of that what looked like a grass becomes wooden, it becomes a sapling and it grows and grows and grows and the, the base gets thicker and thicker and it pushes forth more branches until it becomes a tree and then you see the first time when it's mature enough it flowers and the base of the flowers um, swells and there you get the mango and eventually when the mango is ripe you can pluck it or it falls to the ground and you can eat it. And the question is, so what went across from the first mango to the next mango you're eating? And of course there's nothing in the, f in the mango you're eating now which was there in the mango seed which you planted. It's totally different, but you can see the whole process from moment to moment, day to day how a little seed becomes a tree providing a new mango which you can eat. It's an example of a process without anything in that process which is there in the beginning, there in the middle or near the end. A process without a permanent core, without an essence. And this is how the Buddha was describing just what drives that process we call body and mind from things like delusion to volition, later on craving and uh, fuel for existences. This is the force which drives the process, which is ever changing. One moment, the next moment, very different. So this is a beautiful simile of what the Buddha is saying here. The two extremes, he's saying there's nothing there, of course there's something, you can see the mango, you can see the seed, you can see the tree. There's something there but it's not something permanent. You can't say it is because it's always changing. In science, in maths, it's like the point. The point is not something which doesn't exist but it has no extension. It's got no, you can't measure the length of a point, it's halfway between being and not existing. So, this is the idea of the in-between, not is, can't say there's nothing. In-between, a soul and materialism. And of course the dualism of Western philosophy was always between those two. People who believe in a soul, which was a religious part of Western culture, and those who believe in there's no soul, it's just a byproduct, uh, an illusion created by a brain, which is the other extreme. That's the dualism which the Buddha was pointing to, and the Dhamma is neither of those extremes. It is a third option. So if there was another, uh, other arguments, if there was a soul, a permanent essence, would there be what belongs to a soul? Is attributes. You can know something by, you know, finding out what it consists of, but a much better way to define something is what its function is, what it does. Because you know it's a car if you can sit in it and you can drive around in it. That's what's called a car. It's defined by what it does. And there's so many other things, you know, a, a cup is what you can put tea in. So, uh, one way of understanding what a thing is, what is your soul? What is a soul? You understand it by what it does, not by actually what it is. So, 
if there was a soul, a permanent essence, would there be what belongs to a soul, its attributes? Yes, Venerable Sir, so you can know a soul, a self, by what it possesses, what it owns. A garden, you know it's a garden by its attributes, it's got flowers in it, you know, it's got sort of uh, grass in it. Where you park your cars, you can't say that's a garden, it's got cars in it, it's got asphalt. That's how we know that uh, it's known by what, what uh, is inside of it, what belongs to it. So if there was a soul, would there be that which belongs to a soul? Yes. If there was what belongs to a soul, would there be a soul? Yes, Venerable Sir. The Buddha is saying here, the attributes of a soul are not to be apprehended as true and established. You know, what, what, what do you own? What is part of you? You don't own your will. You prove that many, many times. Advertisers and politicians know that. They influence your will. They take control of it. You don't own your, uh, your mind. You try and stop thinking. Yeah, you'd like to, wouldn't you? So easy, just, I'm going to be still now, I'm going to get into jhanas, I'm not going to do anything. Can you do that? Because you don't own your mind. It's not yours to tell what to do. If you had a slave, then yeah, if it was a slave, you can tell it what to do. But your mind is not your slave. Men have found out they don't own their wives. Can you tell your wife what to do? <laughs> You can't tell your husband what to do either. You don't own them. You might try and you find out that truth. Do you own your body? Of course you don't. I don't want to get sick. I've got lots to do today. But then you can't get sick. So what do you own? What do you control? What you own is what you control. You don't own your kids, your children. You try to control them and that's where you suffer, cause problems. So your mind, you don't own anything. Because you don't own anything, there's nothing which you can control. That's the Buddha's argument. It's proof that there's no soul. No attributes, nothing it owns. <laughs> Since a soul and attributes of a soul are not apprehended as true and established, then this basic belief, namely, this is the soul, this is the world, after death I shall be in permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, I shall endure as long as eternity, would it not be an utterly and completely foolish belief? You know, what is the soul? What does it own? It doesn't own anything. So because it doesn't own anything, because it's no attributes, therefore it doesn't exist. Such speculative beliefs are called the thicket of views, the wilderness of views, the contortion of views, the procrastination of views, the fetter of views. And these are just pretty accurate um, translation of how the Buddha um, translated or b looked at these beliefs. The speculative beliefs. Speculation, it, look, it sort of seems that way. Yeah, it probably will be that way. You don't know it for sure, just like you speculate on the stock market. You've got really good information. Yeah, it looks like that stock is going to go up, but you're not really sure. That's why it's called a speculative belief. You know, it's tentative. You're not really sure, but you're just working on that. So the view of itself is a speculative view. So I like the thicket of views. It's so hard to get through this. You get stuck and scratched by that view of itself. It causes a lot of suffering. The wilderness of views, there's no happiness to be found there. No prosperity. The contortion of views, it's another great simile of the Buddha because you really have to bend the truth and really sort of try your very hard to defend that view. So it's almost like you have to bend over backwards to actually to support that view. Procrastination of views, because it actually puts off, you know, doing what needs to be done. When there's a self, a soul, you say, well, it doesn't matter, the world is not the soul, so I can just eat, drink and be happy because tomorrow I go to heaven. And the fetter of views, because it does stop you being free. Shackled by the fetter of views, the unenlightened person is not freed from birth, aging and death, from sorrow, lamentation, pain, unhappiness and distress. Distress. They are not free from suffering, I say. So actually believing in a 
permanent essence is the main reason why you keep getting reborn. Because there's something there to be reborn. Your belief creates the next world for you to carry on in. Now the unenlightened, oh, this is a, a wonderful little sutta here. Oh, by the way, that one which was the kachana, the two extremes and the middle doctrine, that became such a very famous sutta in the history of Buddhism because as Buddhism became more intellectualized, where monks spent more time arguing than meditating, and they started uh, developing different schools of Buddhism. And you now, first of all, just different interpretations, and then just you know, much more differentiation of ideas and views. And we started getting in the about a thousand years after the time of the Buddha, or maybe a bit earlier than that, the first uh, the first uh, shoots of the Mahayana coming up. And the Mahayana was not uh, anything to do with a difference of practices, but much more of a difference of views and ideas. And it was a very famous uh, Buddhist scholar called Nagarjuna. He was a bit disgusted about all these monks arguing, and mostly about the nature of a self. Is there something there? Is there not something there? And uh, Nagarjuna, he went back to this one sutta. You know, he quoted this. This is what he told everyone to look at, to say, "Look, you're both wrong." The Buddha taught about a middle way, and you know about the. You can't say there's nothing. You can't say there's something. It's in between that way. It's the process, and that actually started. You know what was that became known as the Majjhima doctrine. But strangely enough, that Majjhimaka, which is one of the great schools of Buddhism, that became adopted by Mahayana. And it became one of the great Mahayana schools. But it's based on a sutta which is straight out of Theravada. So many scholars notice this is a real strange anomaly of history. Here he tried to pull everybody together by going back to original teachings of the Buddha and instead of trying to unite people, he actually developed another school. And that's sometimes what happens. You've got two different schools, say you've got the Protestants and the Catholics, and somebody comes along, let's unite everybody, and then we get a third group, the united group. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's what happens in the world of sectarianism. But of course, as a very good monk, I mention it so often, I'm a very good monk, I've been celibate for 42 years, so I don't believe in sex, whichever way you spell them. <laughs> S-E-C-T-S or S-E-X, neither, I don't think. It's very good. Anyway, uh, so this is actually the Kachana Sutta, was so um, famous in the Buddhism 1500 years ago. And anyway, this little one, 1261 here. The unenlightened worldling might experience revulsion from this body, let its importance fade away and be liberated from it. Why? Because growth and decay are seen in this body. Moreover, it is born and dies. You know, we can see that, we know this, and so after a while you get pretty fed up with this body. Don't invest so much in it, when you, especially when you get old. You keep it going, but you know it's a lost cause. No one ever really recovers from sickness in hospital. They just put off dying for a few more years. You will end up getting sick again. So what is that great saying, the definition of life? Life is a sexually transmitted terminal disease. It's a very, very wonderful say. <laughs> Unfortunately, though, that came after the time of the Buddha. That's so. So anyway, this body, we can all see that. And sometimes if it's revulsion, this body, isn't there something else? That it's important to fade away and be liberated from it. Why? Because growth and decay are seen in this body. Moreover, it's born and dies, whatever you do. But this thing which is called mind, 
or mentality or consciousness. And I just pause here because sometimes the way it is written in these ancient languages is very precise. They have an or there, not and. This one thing which people call all sorts of different names. You might call it your heart, your essence, the mind, consciousness, awareness, what the knower. We have so many different words, but it's all pointing to this same idea of a permanent essence, a soul, an essential being, a heart of you. And here, this is what the Buddha is saying, that one thing, which is called, sometimes called mind, sometimes called mentality, or sometimes called consciousness, those three party words, citta, mano, or vinyana, that one thing which is called by all these different names, the unenlightened worldling, people who haven't seen the Dhamma, is unable, they just can't do it, to experience revulsion towards it. Revulsion towards your mind. Fed up with it, had enough with it. Why? And let its importance fade away and be liberated from it, why? Because for a long time you have held, appropriated and grasped the wrong view that this chitta or mind or consciousness, whatever you call it, is mine. This I am. This is my permanent essence. So because of that view, that there is something inside of you, a self, a soul, a permanent essence, a mind, a chitta, whatever, because you've grasped it, this is what the grasping is, that this is mine, this is who I am, this is my permanent essence. That's why it's impossible to doubt it, to see it fade away, to let it go. So, next one, suppose a fire, again this is one of the ones I quote very often, Agi Wachagota Sutta, Suppose a fire was burning in front of you. Would you know that a fire was burning in front of you? Of course. If someone asked you what this fire burnt in dependence on, how would you answer? You would answer that the fire was burning in dependence on the fuel of grass and sticks. If the fire was extinguished, and they use the word nibbuto, it's the past participle of nibbana. Nibbana is a noun, nibbuto it's, means nibbanat. If this fire was extinguished, would you know that the fire was extinguished? Yes, of course. And if someone then asked you where that fire went to when it was extinguished, did it go to the east, the west, the north or the south? How would you answer? The question makes no sense. The fire burnt in dependence on its fuel of grass and sticks. When that was used up, not getting any more fuel, it became extinguished, it didn't go anywhere. So too, where does an enlightened one go after death? The question makes no sense. Do you get it? <laughs> does the enlightened one go to the north, the south, the west, the east? Of course not. It was just dependent on many things, like the fire depended on grass and sticks, when the grass and sticks were all used up, it nibbuted in the barnard. Didn't go anywhere. At last we have a question. Yes, John. Um, the wrong views of the self and, and, hmm. the, and the common one, which fits quite easy actually, is to view, uh, you see what you did wrong and what you did right and so yeah. forth. Now who is actually seeing that? <laughs> who is actually seeing that? Wrong question. That's an unprofitable question. Who is actually seeing it assumes there is some person there, a being, a who. So instead we change the question to something which is more profitable. What is experiencing that? Not a who. You can see that sometimes when you put the question wrong, you find no real good answer. If you ask the question, who am I? Then that's look, trying to find the Loch Ness Monster again. It has no ending to it, just because you haven't discovered it yet. You assume, who am I, that you exist. There is a being, a person, an essence. 
you're just trying to find it. And just because you haven't found a good answer yet doesn't mean you're going to give up your belief. Just because you haven't found the Loch Ness Monster doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So you're asking the one question, you said, what do I take myself to be? Now, what is experiencing this? And then you find it's just these five components of existence. What is hearing me? It's just the sense of, of sound. You have sense base of hearing. There is um, sound coming from my mouth. And the two come together and consciousness turns on. And you're aware of it and the brain interprets it. And the mind knows what your brain has experienced as sound. It's a process, that's all. Not a thing. So when you ask what is experiencing this, rather than who, it becomes a profitable question, not an unprofitable one. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Okay, at the back, yes, Chris. One day after the Buddha died, all the Buddhists that lived on up to now, they take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and the Sangha. Yes. What are we taking refuge in when we say we're taking refuge in the Buddha? So, are we taking refuge in a memory of a guy that was around 2,500 uh -huh. years ago? What are we taking refuge in? What you're taking refuge in, uh, there's two answers to that. One of the things you're taking refuge in is not to the person, but actually to the existence of enlightenment. The Buddha as a, uh, a stage in this process which we call the five components of existence, the khandhas, the final stage. That there are Buddhas around, that the Buddha existed. Not as a being, because you know, beings are not important. But it's a process. It's one of the reasons why that if you ever go to um, India and see some of the old carvings, and those carvings are not from the earliest days, but maybe 300, 400, 500 years after the Buddha passed away, he would always be represented as a footprint with no person, no, no, no foot or leg or body there. Sometimes an empty seat sometimes oh, uh, a tree, but no one sitting underneath it. It was always a, a symbol of an absence. A Buddha was not a being, but a Buddha was an absence of a being, an emptiness. That's why, it's, oh, sometimes the other thing you saw was a seat, but with no one sitting on it. They became like the symbols of the Buddha. So when people took refuge in that, they understood what they were really taking refuge in. Of course, now, they have solid Buddha statues. It's something much more tangible, which means our beliefs are much more solid and tangible. And people believe in a Buddha as sometimes, we have seen this, uh, praying to Buddha that my, my girlfriend will actually fall in love with me, or that, you know, that I will actually win the lottery next week. And people actually do that here, depend, independent of what all the monks and nuns teach over the years. But they take the refuge as something more solid. But as we go more deeper, the great uh, saying is that the one who sees the Buddha sees the Dhamma, the one who sees the Dhamma sees the Buddha. And those two become indistinguishable. So when I take refuge in the Buddha, in the deeper sense, I'll be taking refuge uh, into the fact that Dharma can be manifest in a human being. So what is the role of devotion? In the role Buddhism? of devotion is being devoted to the Dharma, to the Buddha. A good example of that is, and I quote the, I quoted this even today, that uh, the Buddha said to Ananda, just before the Buddha passed away, you don't pay, you don't worship, you don't pay devotion to the Buddha by offering flowers and candles and incense. Don't do that, he said, but still we do that. We pay devotion to the Buddha by following the teachings he gave us. 
That's the only way to worship a Buddha. Following the teachings, the example. So, and my take on that was one of the first stories in Good Bad Who Knows, and stories of flushing the Holy Quran down the toilet. And they say, what would happen if you flushed a, a Buddhist holy text down the toilet, Ajahn Brahm? They say, yeah, you can flush as many Buddhist holy texts down the toilet as you like. You can block the Buddha statues, you can burn down this temple, you can kill all the monks and nuns. But I will never allow you to flush Buddhism down the toilet. To flush peace, kindness, forgiveness, tolerance. And that's where I started to mention the difference between containers and contents. Now that is a mistake most people make. That's not the Buddha. That's a container. What did that symbolize? So that's where we take refuge, not in the container of the Buddha, the person, the statue, but the contents. What did the Buddha embody, teach, practice? The example is what we take refuge in. So what would you recommend as our stance towards uh, other beings that have become enlightened since the time of the Buddha? Uh, you know, you can know that there's some you know, uh, traditions in the Tibetan Buddhism and other uh, traditions that say that there are other people that have followed in the Buddha's footsteps, even in the early monks after the Buddha who became exactly. enlightened. What is your view about how we should um, adopt an attitude towards these people and do we show them respect and reverence or do we you show, uh, just discount yeah. them? Or you show what they, res what they represent as reverence, not the being but what they represent. Well, some of those people have got pretty profound teachings. Yeah, exactly. But you, it's the visions you respect, not the persons. Depersonalize it. Because otherwise, my guru. So you follow the guru, but you don't follow the teachings. And sometimes when it becomes like a personalized, then the, seeing the person is important. Listening to the teachings are not important. Just, uh, just being with somebody but not following what they say is more important. So you see that the people you know, become important, not their message. That happens here, and I'm, I'm John with you. Of course it does. So you should just follow what I say, not what I am. <laughs> yeah, go on. Ajahn Brahm. I thought in the scriptures it didn't mention, you know, before the Buddha died, what, what, yeah. before the Buddha yeah, well, he was dying, and then I think it's Ananda said, was crying, and then he was saying to the Buddha, when you've gone this thing, you know, who do we take refuge to? And the reply from the Buddha is, you see me through my teachings. Yeah, that's so what he said. Dharma. That, what the Buddha actually said, who will be our teacher? So not who you take refuge in, but who will be our teacher? And that's when the Buddha said, your teacher will be the teachings which I've left you. But your refuge will always be the Buddha, Dharma and the Sangha. Those are your three refuges. But your teacher will be the teachings. Okay, yes. Oh, uh, this is the... Oh yeah. Well, no, that's number three, I think. Or number four. I perceive there is no soul with a soul. So that's number four. So that you infer... Uh, that a, with something to do with... Um, I wasn't sure if the people were saying about the soul, that they believed in a soul. Yes. So because I haven't got four up there, I yeah. have a minute. Uh, yeah, there are all these ones, there is yeah. a belief that there is a soul, but they say, yes, there's a soul, but it could never be perceived. Oh, because I was getting confused there, because earlier on you said, 
um, because you believe in the Loch Ness Monster, or you don't yeah. believe in the Loch Ness Monster, yeah. it doesn't mean to say it's not there. Exactly. So yeah. that's where I'm getting a bit confused with that. Okay. It says, once you believe in a soul, and you, know, you believe there is a Loch Ness Monster, it's so hard to disprove that. So there's different ways you know, of looking at that. Ah. They say, well, you know, the Loch Ness Monster is invisible, we just do not have the apparatus to find it, but we're sure it exists. Mm. So this is the same to say that in the days we didn't have a mirror. Yes, we have a face, but we can never see it. So this is like, yes, we know there's a soul, but you know, the, our apparatus, the means by which we can know things, mm -hmm. it just cannot go that far. I see. So we were not saying, as Buddhists, that they're, they're wrong, there is no soul. We're not saying that then. Uh, no, no, what we're actually saying, the idea of a soul itself, it's just, you're asking the wrong question, which is right. who am I, or who's watching this? Uh -huh. And instead we actually do so because this is wrong, unwise contemplations. Mm -hmm. We're digging in the wrong place. Mm. Okay, so, thank you. Yes. So getting back to the end about the question of the um, essence, flowers, and that this ritual that we oh, do, yeah, yeah. Uh, why do we carry that on if we're trying to come into the 20th century? Because I do hear yeah. people saying sometimes, why do you do all that rubbish of bowing and yeah. incense? And I, with us, we just say, well, it makes us, it uh, gives us that humility. Yeah. But the way you were speaking just now is, oh, well, we re really shouldn't be having that. It does, right? it's, it's harmless to offer flowers to the Buddha. I mean, it's actually harmless for Ainsley to offer you flowers on your birthday. But it is like a way of, <laughs> a way we show our respect and love and appreciation for somebody. And that's always happened over the, the centuries. Mm -hmm. Because flowers are beautiful things. We want to offer something beautiful and simple to people we respect and love. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason why. But it's wrong if that's the only thing you do. So, if that's all Ainsley ever did, gives you flowers <laughs> on your birthday, and he never really was kind and appreciated you and looked after you and loved you for the rest of the time, then it would be just useless. So, what he was saying there, you shouldn't just, you know, just offer flowers to a Buddha and not just pay heed to the advice he's giving you. The most important thing, you can give flowers, you don't give flowers, but what really is important, the real way you can pay respect to somebody, as a teacher, is to follow their example, to do what they advise. Sure. So okay, that's what the Buddhists will say. Mm -hmm. And again, now there is too much rituals, as you know, in most uh, communities, in most religions, not just Buddhism, in Christianity and stuff. Oh, I remember going to the first ordination of a, of a, uh, a priest, no, it was a bishop, of uh, K. Goldsworth, I think it was. I got an invite to St. George because it was the first female bishop in any Christian tradition in the world. And it was done here in Perth. So I got an invite. Two hours it took. So much ceremonies and rituals just to make one someone a bishop. Fortunately, I was sitting next to my mate, Abbot Placid. He was the old abbot of the Benedictine Monastery in New Norcia. We had a little little pew for non-believers. Non so I was there with the Catholics and as the Uniting Church. We had a great time because we were telling jokes to each other. You know, like naughty schoolboys in church, but because we were both abbots and we couldn't be sent out. <laughs> that was a lovely time. Without his presence there, I'd have just been so bored. You know, two hours of ceremonies. So we all do our over-ritualized stuff. And of course, in our 21st century, some people like rituals, and they really get off on them. Fine, if you want to go to rituals, no, don't come here. I like it just, you know, basic, right, straight down to earth. But other people like those rituals, fair enough. Yes, Don? Yeah. Meditation, isn't it? It's not only a ritual, oh. it's more than a ritual. It would be wonderful if there was more meditation than chanting. But in most of the times, people offer their flowers and they, they leave. So that's what usually happens. If we do like a flower puja here, a flower ceremony, you know, we put a bit more 
effort into giving a Dharma talk. Uh, not just giving the precepts, you know, but maybe doing a bit of meditation, fine. But in many places, they offer the flowers to the Bodhi tree, do a bit of chanting, and off they go. So there's not that much meditation which I've seen in some of the temples which I've been to. But if the people actually reflect on what the stanza means... Oh, if they could reflect, that'd be wonderful. Then the second part is the... But a lot of time they say in Pali, and even when I, went, when I was in Sri Lanka recently, many of the lay people said, even when, when monks give bhāna, give the teachings, they use such complicated language with so many sort of terms which are just based on Pali, a lot of people say, don't understand a word that monk was saying. <laughs> because even the language, the monks in Sri Lanka, they actually do use a special language, you know, a very Buddhist language, which is not what common people speak. So, you know, even the language, you know, has to be brought down to earth. You know, as the taxi drivers, as the people selling bananas in the market, you know, would say. And then people can actually understand them. That's why they liked giving, hearing talks in English. Even though for many English was their second language, they could understand the Dharma better in English than they could in Sinhala. You know, that's the same in Thailand as well. People use really uh, very philosophical language. They use jargon. And sometimes you can't understand what the, what the heck they're saying. And because in places like Thailand and Sri Lanka, people are just so reverent to the monks. Even if they don't understand it, they say, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And so the monk comes away thinking, oh, you know, really good Tama talk. Because, you know, you don't say, that monk, that was, I didn't understand a word of it. <laughs> so this is what I'm very happy with being in Australia, because if I make a mistake, I get so many emails back. And so, you know, they, they keep me honest. So thank you so much for your criticisms. <laughs> it's true. Okay, uh, where were we? Oh, this is the right view. And views and discussions about the soul. Are you okay just carrying on? It's four o'clock now? No, I usually say till 4.30 in this class. Okay, here we go. Now one who says, experience is my permanent essence. Now this is very common that, you know, I am because I think. It's not just think, because I feel. I know, I can hear this, therefore I must be. So experience is my permanent essence. Should be told, there are three kinds of experience, pleasant, painful, and neutral. Which of these three do you consider to be your soul, your permanent essence? What is pointing out here that experience is always changing. It's never the same. And they, in this particular case, you can see it divided into three parts, um, pleasant, painful, and neutral. Which of the three do you consider to be your soul? When a pleasant experience is felt, no painful or neutral experience is felt, but only pleasant experience, and the same with the other two combinations. When painful is felt, no pleasant or neutral is there, only painful. And when a neutral experience is felt, no painful or pleasant is there, only neutral experience. You only feel one at a time. So you know that pleasant experience is impermanent, conditioned. In other words, you have to have its causes for being uh, pleasant. Dependently arisen, bound to decay, to vanish, to fade away, to cease, and so to our painful experience and neutral experience, they don't last. You know, that's a beautiful thing to keep in mind. Pleasant ex experience, we get so disappointed when it disappears. But please notice, it has to disappear. You know, just, you know, I try to teach a lot by using humor. When people say, you know, I ask you how I do, oh, I'm doing well, and I say, it won't last. <laughs> <laughs> people say, that's really nasty, yeah, jump up. Having a good day today. How are you? Are you healthy today? Are you overcome your operation? I'm feeling healthy now. It won't last. <coughs> You've got to say that because it's true. And I also say when people are having a hard time, this too will pass. And that's a wonderful thing to know when things aren't going well in your life, when they're painful, when they're suffering. That is one of the things which you always remember if you're in hospital, really sick, in great pain, 
going through difficult times in your life, emotional difficulties as well as physical pain. Please remember, it doesn't last. It can't last. By its very nature, no matter what you do, no matter what the universe throws at you, it cannot last. And that shows that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, which gives you a lot of solace. So many people have actually got through some very difficult times just noticing it is impermanent. So, but the point here is, you know, because experience is sometimes pleasant, sometimes painful, sometimes in between, that you know it's not permanent, it cannot be an essence. So, understanding that experience, so anyone who on experiencing, sorry, anyone who on experiencing a pleasant experience thinks, this is my soul, my permanent essence, must at the cessation of that pleasant experience think, my soul has gone. <laughs> and with the same with painful and neutral experience. Thus whoever thinks experiences my soul is contemplating something in its present life that is impermanent, a mixture of happiness and unha unhappiness, subject to arising and passing away. Therefore it is not fitting to maintain the experience is my soul. Fair enough, so let's refine it. But anyone who says experience is not my soul, but my soul is, but doesn't experience anything, should be asked, if there were no experience at all, could there be the concept I am? Because even the thought I am is an experience, to which one would have to answer no. Therefore it is not tenable to maintain experience is not my soul. My soul is, but doesn't experience anything. If your soul doesn't experience anything, it doesn't exist. To exist is to experience. And sometimes people say that. Yeah, it is happiness and suffering in my, the world, but my soul is beyond that. My soul doesn't suffer, doesn't have happiness, doesn't have pain, doesn't have anything even in between. In other words, it doesn't exist. You can't even think, I am. And anyone who says, okay, fair enough, let's try something else. Experience is not my soul. My soul is but does not actually experience anything, but my soul performs the act of experience. In other words, experience is something net, uh, outside of the soul, like, you know, I'm the operator of the computer, so I am the soul, my computer is experience, I'm the one who actually uh, messes around, I, I perform the act of experience. That's the nature of a soul, to perform acts of experience. So should be asked, well, if all experience absolutely and totally ceased, it wasn't performing anything, could there be the concept, I am this, to which one would have to reply, no. In other words, if the soul did not perform any act of experience, if it didn't do anything, again, it would not be there. This goes back to a very um, uh, common philosophical uh, insight, again, first for many Descartes that I think therefore I am and I saw this, this was graffiti oh no that's a, no he said something else I think therefore I am was one of his sayings but he also said uh, to do is to be so doing if you do something is a sign you exist and obviously that's if you look at a body which is dead it doesn't do anything, it doesn't respond. You know, you shout at it, you prick it, you open its eyes and shine a light in its eyeballs and then nothing happens. If it doesn't do anything, it's dead. So he's saying, you know, to do is to be. And that was Rene Descartes and this was on the wall of the philosophy department in Cambridge. I saw it myself when I was a student there in 69, 70 or somewhere around then. To do is to be Rene Descartes. And then it was the French philosopher Sartre you know, turned it around and he said, to be is to do, an existential philosophy. Turned around when he kept take up, instead of to do is to be, to be is to do. In other words, to actually exist in this world you have to go out there and do stuff. That is the meaning of life, to do, to interact, to go, to do things. 
And then the last line was from the American philosopher, dooby dooby doo, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> And that was actually on the wall philosophy department. Brilliant sort of insight there, putting it all together. To be is to do. <laughs> Descartes, to do is to be, or the other way around, sorry, it was uh, Sartre, dooby dooby doo, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> but this is actually with the thing about experience. If you don't experience anything, you aren't. So the idea of if your soul is actually what performs experience, when it stops performing experience, it doesn't exist anymore. It stops. And the whole idea of a soul is it actually is permanently, a permanent essence. Uh, so, from the time when a meditator no longer regards experience as a soul, or that the soul is, but does not experience anything, what the soul is, doesn't experience anything, but the soul performs the act of experience, that's its nature. When they don't regard those things, but you regard you know, in the way of those three things are, are not there, then you cling to nothing in the world. By clinging is you don't sort of cling to this being my permanent essence, that being my permanent essence, this being my permanent essence. And when you realize there is no permanent essence to protect or to cling to, then not clinging to anything, you're not excited by anything. And by not being excited by anything, you gain personal liberation. You know rebirth is finished, the whole life has been led, done was what had to be done, there's nothing more here. Even experience doesn't belong to you. It's not me. It's not mine, it's not my essence. Therefore, you can let experience stop. The only reason why it won't stop is because you've got a personal investment in it. That's me. I am experience. Therefore, there's no way I can let that go. And where that happens is when you meditate and things start to disappear, and experience begins to fade away, then you get scared, your body starts to go, and you say, oh, I'm going. <laughs> you're not hearing, you're not smelling, tasting, touching, you're disappearing. Ah, I'm vanishing. And that's scary. That's where fear comes from when you meditate. So many people get afraid. What they're afraid of, they're afraid of letting go of what they're attached to. Not me being attached to that, but the one doing the attaching, that's what you're letting go of. Many, many years ago, I'm going off on tangents as usual, I tried to get similes to explain these things more broadly in English. And I just noticed being a monk, you know, I was sexually active before I was a monk, I had girlfriends, and I had to give all that up. I had to let it go, detach. It's a hard thing to do for a young man. But then I started getting really into food, especially sweets. So I come stop that, that's another form of desire and craving. So I gave that up, then it was maybe cups of tea. No, come on. And I noticed in life, whenever you give up one attachment, you go and attach to something else. And it seems to be, you know, that's a, the nature of life. And I thought, this is endless. I let go of one thing and I go and attach to something else. You let go of watching the TV and then you attach to the internet. You go, okay, it's no, no more internet, no more internet games. I'm not going to do any more internet. Then you go and attach to something else. I realize there's a problem here. Why do people always attach? And that's when I got the simile of the hand. Why does my hand always pick up things? That's an excuse to have a cup of tea. But when I'm not picking up the tea, oh, I'll put it up, put it down, come on, stop playing around. Pick up something else. I noticed my hand was always picking things up. Why? Because that's the nature of a hand. That's what it does, that's what it's for, that's its function, to pick things up. So I thought, how can I stop picking things up? And I thought, cut off my hand. And I never did this, it was just like a thought experiment. 
If I cut off my hand, that's the only way I'll stop picking things up. Thought, ah, yeah. The only way I can really stop picking things up with my mind, attaching to things, is to cut off the thing which does the picking up. And that was my sense of self. As long as you have a sense of a permanent essence of self in there, you will always attach to things because that is what the self does. That's its function. You know it by its attributes, by what it owns, by what it does. So I thought that was really neat. I thought I was so smart thinking up that simile until I found the Buddha got there before me. He's got the simile of the hand. The simile of the hand on the foot, he has two of them. And oh, that was really f spooky. Now when, and I hadn't read that before, not in this life anyway. I was reading that, wow, that's my simile. But I had to admit the Buddha, because he lived before me, he must have got there first. But because of that, that became a very important simile for me. The only way to actually to let go of attaching to things, the only way to stop being reborn, is to cut off and see that thing which does the attaching. Not the objects of attachment, they're endless. But the thing which does the attaching, the sense of self, to see that doesn't exist. And once that happens, letting go is easy. <coughs> so, uh, Majjhima Nikai 148. If anyone says the mind is the soul, and that's a lot of other people, not just experience, but the knower, that which knows is the soul. The appearance and disappearance of the mind are discerned. If you have a look and understand what we mean by the mind, the knower, you know, there's times you're under anesthetic, you don't know anything, you go to sleep. Even in meditation, the mind disappears for many of you. <laughs> So then, if the mind is the soul, where have you gone? <laughs> he disappeared. The appearance and disappearance of the mind are discerned. And since its appearance and disappearance are discerned, it would follow that my so soul appears and then disappears. That is why it's not tenable for anyone to say the mind is the soul. Thus the mind is not the soul. If anyone was saying that the objects of the mind are the soul, mind consciousness is the soul, experience is the soul, we've done that one, wanting is the soul. And this is, when I first saw that, wow, that's interesting. Wanting, which is like the craving, the thirst, that that is who I am, that's what drives me, the driver of life. And they say, because sometimes when you don't want anything, when you're content, it's like you disappear. Now to want, to crave, when you are wanting something and striving for it, you have a very strong sense of being and existing. Or when you have the opposite, you know, the anger, going on a demonstration, a protest, standing outside of parliament, denouncing, this party or that party or Donald Trump or whoever it is, you feel alive. Because to want, to do, or aversion, anger, gives you a sense of existence. So, if you say wanting is the real me, then of course sometimes that disappears. So where have you gone? That's why it's not tenable for anyone to say the wanting, the craving is the soul. Thus the mind is not the soul, mind objects are not the soul, mind conscious is not the soul, mind objects is not the soul. Oh, I've got that too. Experience is not the soul, wanting is not the soul. And it would be rather better, said this already, for the uninstructed worldling to take as the soul this body rather than the mind. At least the body lasts a long time. Because this body lasts for up to a hundred years or even longer. So at least it has some sense of permanence, this body. But anything to do with the mind, consciousness, experience, it comes and goes so quickly. But that thing that is called the mind, or mentality, or consciousness, arises as one thing and ceases another all the time. Actually, in the Sutra it says, by day and by night, and that's just such a confusing thing. It means all the time, so translate it as it should be translated. But okay. That is the unwise considerations, 
which take much more space than the wise considerations. That's because there's so many different ways to be unwise, but very <laughs> simple ways to be wise. So an enlightened one, or one on the path to enlightenment, understands what things are fit for attention, what things are unfit for attention. Thus they do not contemplate things unfit for attention, only those things fit, fit for attention. You contemplate the suffering, the origin, what, what actually causes suffering? This is getting the bullet out, instead of just, you know, do I exist, do I not exist? And the cessation of suffering, the origin of suffering is the wanting. When you stop wanting, things vanish. And this is the way leading to cessation of suffering, the Eightfold Path. And when you contemplate in this way, three fetters are abandoned in you. A view of a permanent essence. You see that that's a false view. There is no soul in here, nothing permanent. But remember, if you haven't understood that, the middle way thing, people say, well, there's no soul, then what gets enlightened? You know, whether what gets reborn? You know, why do what, what experiences come are later on? There's nobody in here. It doesn't mean there's no one in here. There's nothing. It doesn't mean there's a permanent soul. The process, the third option, not the duality of this or that, the in-between, which is a process. That's why this dependent origination is so powerful. It describes the process. A leads to B, and when B arises, A is totally gone. B leads to C, and when C arises, B is totally vanished. Nothing goes across, just a process, a cause and effect. Giving the illusion of a self, but it's just a process. It's not there's nothing, there is something, you can hear me. There is, but not a permanent essence. A process, the third option. So, uh, you contemplate suffering. And remember what it said earlier, what arises is only suffering arising, suffering passing away. Agitation, irritation, stops the, uh, the beautiful peace of nothing. When you contemplate in this way, three fetters are abandoned in your view of a permanent essence, skeptical doubt, you see, you know, you don't need to doubt or have any sort of um, faith anymore. If it's just faith and belief, there's always doubt attached to that. You never really know for yourself. And a belief that rites and rituals are sufficient in themselves to reach enlightenment. Those who have abandoned three fetters are all stream enterers, no longer subject to rebirth in a lower realm, and headed for full enlightenment. And the reason they're no longer subject to rebirth in a lower realm is that they can let go of the bad karma which would usually make them feel guilty enough to send themselves to a lower realm. It's the old guilt thing. How many of you, yeah, you should forgive. You've heard me talk about that. You've read other people talk about that. You've learned it in the city. You know it's really important to forgive and let go of the past. But can you do it? No, not until you have seen there's nobody in here. When you finally see there's no permanent essence, who's there to blame? And this guilt thing, which really comes from the sense of a self, a permanent essence which was responsible for all of this, that is, disappears at Strubina. The idea of guilt and blame, when you realize there's nobody in there, when there's no driver at the bus seat, then you stop complaining. You stop getting angry at the bus driver. Why did you stop here? Why can't you drive faster? Why can't you do this? They do have Uber cars now. And I'm sure that when Uber, no, not Uber cars, the Google cars, the driverless cars, when more people go in the driverless cars and they have a crash or they turn the wrong way, 
You got no husband, you stupid husband, you should look at the map before you drive. You know wife, you know, you always lose directions, wife, you've got no one to complain to anymore. That would make driving very boring in, in the Google cars. <laughs> so, when there's no one to complain to, it means there's no guilt. When there's no guilt, the bad karma of the past doesn't actually catch you. No more rebirth in lower realms. You don't need it anymore. Yeah. I remember picking up a newspaper yesterday for somebody and the headline said, if you were raped, could you forgive that person? And immediately my mind said, no way. Because an experience like that must stay with people for the, or the woman for the rest of her life. She, she would have such a job to get rid of that. In fact, surely you cannot get rid of a thought like that. It's a horrible experience. So anyway, I've just wanted to share that. I just yeah. immediately said, no, I could not forgive that person. But then I've met many people who have forgiven. And it's so inspiring to see such people who have mm. been terribly raped, not just mm. all rape is terrible, but I mean really horrendous stuff. And they have forgiven. And they say that when they have forgiven, at that point they are free. I could understand that, if you can reach that point, yes. And the thing is that when our society says or implies there's something wrong with you if you forgive, when they expect you to always keep that anger, when they say it's impossible, it closes off a huge avenue of freedom. That is why there are inspirational men and women who come up and give talks and just say how they've resolved that pain by forgiving. Mm. And they say that they are so free. They were tortured once. Why do they have to allow that person to torture them for the rest of their life? When they forgive, it means they don't never sort of agree and think that's a wonderful thing which happened to them. No, no, obviously not. No, it's just a terrible thing. But now the emotional scar has healed. That's why it's such, such an important thing. Any type of trauma, without forgiveness, that trauma is a huge burden on your life forever. Until that moment comes when they let it go. And, and they can how only does this equate with you are not in charge. You very often hear that, You're, you are not in charge, therefore, how does that happen? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, just why these things happen, it's, and there's a lot of reason for that, uh, why those things happen, the sexualization of society, just the general boredom, just, you know, the lack of just, you know, the village cultures where people are comfortable, so there's so many causes, but that's another argument, that's another thing to look at. No, sorry Arjun, maybe I didn't explain oh, that sorry. properly. Uh, what I was meaning was that for that person to be able to forgive, as you said, yeah. you've met them, and then have the confusion of, well, you're not in charge. That means you're not in charge of forgiving yourself, or forgiving. Oh, oh. I'm a bit, oh that one, do yeah. Do you understand me? Indeed. I mean, this is why when that is encouraged by our community, by our society, by others, you can't do it for yourself. You need help, encouragement. Mm. And one of the things is, it's possible, you can do it, it's allowable. Mm -hmm. And just to know that, you mean I, I can forgive? And that is a possibility, it's a huge um, opening of other avenues. Mm. I always say the first thing about forgiveness is to know that you can forgive. And the second thing is, see the benefits of forgiveness. And once you've marketed forgiveness to yourself, then the ways of forgiveness are just many, many, many. Mm. But also, the problem doesn't stop when you're forgiving yourself. Your personal problem has stopped. Now, you've got to make sure, learn from it, make sure it doesn't happen again or it happens less frequently. That's why the people who have been through that and they know what they're talking about, 
they can just really go up there and just give amazing uh, advice why these things happen mm -hmm. and how strategies to make sure they never happen again or happen much less frequently. Thank but, without, but without that forgiveness, mm -hmm. it gets suppressed deep oh, yeah. inside a person and they suffer and suffer and suffer and sometimes they don't know what, why they're suffering, mm -hmm. why their life is going sort of pear-shaped. Acknowledge, forgive and learn, the AFL code. Mm -hmm. So, and that happens very, makes it much easier when it's not a personal thing anymore. I don't know how many times that I've read, seen, that people think that they're, they're dirty, they're, they're not worth anything anymore. The girl has not done nothing absolutely wrong, not their fault at all. But they take on this, this uh, sense of uh, uselessness, meaninglessness, and that's what happens when you don't forgive. Mm. Thank you. How does that equate? How does that equate with the third, the process, the third way? The third the way of the and the, How does it all slot together? Well, it is. It's just not a not a being in there. It's this process which has been defiled and hurt. But it's. When one sees there's not a person there but a process, it makes forgiveness much easier because it's much easier to let go when there's nothing doing the holding and grasping. It's much easier to let go of things. As long as there's a hand, you always pick up things. As long as there's a sense of me, there's always a sense of guilt and a sense of uh, hurt, which we won't let go. You are not that girl who was raped. You're a different person. And that gives avenues for freedom. No one can defile you. You always change. So, this is another way of looking. But I'm going off point now, be off um, because I was doing about the sense of self and how once that sense of self has been seen for what it is, just a delusion, an assumption which has no basis, and the third option gives you something else to replace it by, that makes it easier to let go. That's why one becomes a stream winner. Yes, Don, L make it the last question. Yeah, very quickly, uh, just to get back to the soul, yeah? could one argue that your accumulated karma is really the equivalent of the soul because that is what you carry across from life to life and that's what, you de what determines what you are going to be. Yeah, the, the soul is like the vehicle and the karma is the container, it's the contents of that. So I mentioned that because I just see Sompok, he's putting all of the dana which we've accumulated on the weekend into the car to take back to Bodhinyana over there. But the karma is not really defines the soul because it's just the karma is what you put into that soul. It's almost like the contents. Because that's one of the other thing, once that sense of soul is seen for what it is and vanishes, you've got no container anymore. You can't drive things off into the future. You've got nothing to carry the karma. So, if the karma is what goes into the, uh, and the soul is the container, yeah. then it exists, isn't it? Oh, it doesn't exist. It's only that if you think it exists, if that is your view, then you have a container and then karma can be carried. But if you see that for what it is, it's not a, it's not a, a container after all, then you can't fit anything in. So it's the, the delusion which creates that sense of self and with that sense of self it does create the possibility for karma to be carried. Okay, now there usually is a couple of questions on the, from overseas so I should really deal with those and uh, quickly and then we'll finish off for the day because it's a nice place to finish off because the next one is the stream winning, which we'll do that in a couple of weeks' time. In South Australia, how do you differentiate between the revulsion to the mind and Wibbawadanha? 
Weber Wadanha is trying to destroy something. It's a craving not to exist, but which is really just a craving, an I wanting to destroy a self. The simile which I use for the craving to annihilate something is from Oliver Twist, where one of the characters says, says if Oliver comes back with a five pound note, then I'll eat my own head. And to eat your own head is like uh, the craving to destroy, your, to destroy existence. I want to stop existence. Try to eat your own head. You can say it, you can contemplate it, but it's a bit difficult to actually to do in practice. The revulsion towards the mind is actually to see it just as a cause of suffering. And so the revulsion means, re sometimes I use the word repulsion instead of revulsion. It's just, you're not interested in it anymore. In, you know, sometimes it's like when you had toys as a kid. There comes a time when you don't want to play with those toys anymore. And you've been there, done that, and you just turn away from it. That's the meaning of revulsion. So in the USA, if you don't exist anywhere after Nibbana, how is this different to nihilism? It's different to nihilism because nihilism, again, is the sense that there is nothing. You don't say there's something, there is this third option of a process. So this process, you know, is the difference between the dualism of nothing and something. And this is describing life, existence, you know, world in front of us. After uh, Nibbana, this is Paranibbana they mean, uh, Paranibbana means when a person is enlightened, dies, then there is nothing there, and the reason there's nothing there is nothing there to begin with. But nihilism is a doctrine of in this world there is nothing. And I think that there was one philosopher who espoused that, there is nothing in this world, and it was George Bernard Shaw kicked him. And when this philosopher said, Al, you have been disproved. <laughs> And lastly, in Singapore, right view is perfected only on stream entry, which needs one to walk the Eightfold Path. How should a soul believer walk the rest of the Eightfold Path to eventually get right view? A soul believer walk the rest of the Eightfold Path. Is the soul believer, after a while, you know, you hear these things and they make a lot of sense. I think it is actually important what I said earlier, you need an alternative. The, you know, the third way, you know, mentioned as you know, between existence and non-existence. Because otherwise anyone who says, you know, there is no soul, nihilist, or you know, there is something, both are unsatisfactory. And to find an alternative, that third way taught by the Buddha, he called it the middle way, between existence and non-existence, is very helpful. Because, ah, what I took to be a self, which I said, it didn't make any sense, there's nothing there, nihilism doesn't make sense. But now I understand what this is. What I took to be a self is just a process. And that makes a lot of help for a person to see it in another way. And of course, the other way which does it is do some meditation, let this sort of things disappear, and then it becomes really obvious. Okay, that was PJ, a good old friend in Singapore. Hopefully you're okay. So, now we can finish off because I've gone over time as usual. And we can pay respects to the Buddha Dhamma and the Sangha. And then I can go back to my monastery. I haven't been for a couple of weeks. Been in Thailand and here. And you can all go home to a nice dinner. Sorry.